very happy that you're here with us. Um, so uh, Anna Karen is somebody that I admire a lot. We've been working for the whole last year together. She has been in charge of the new strategy for new and women, uh, moving from a startup is sort of phase to a phase where you can really have a even bigger impact. Um, she has always been uh, in her almost 20 years of professional life working on issues around women and, and girls, starting in UNICEF, has lived all around the world in Kenya, in Thailand, um, in Madagascar. Um, and she also has, in, importantly, she was the, the program manager in the region for uh, violence against women, which is a topic that has become very central, but uh, Anna Karin has been working on this for many years before it was, it, it had such a big attention. Um, then she became deputy regional director in Thailand for Asia and Pacific. And now, as I mentioned, she is the interim director for strategy. In that strategy, uh, I have seen how Anna Karin embodies what a wonderful feminine leader should be. I think she manages both the very um, feminine, um, sort of nurturing, but also the other side that we've always spoke about, the yin and the yang, the, also the masculine that gets things done in a way that doesn't necessarily hurt people like we see many times in traditional uh, organizations, but in a way that really holds people accountable. So the way she leads is, is an example and the position she has is has huge potential. And this is why we invited her today. So thank you, Anna Karin, for being with us. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, it's to be here. So we, 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 I wanted to start from the beginning. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your, your personal journey? I think it's a fascinating one and I and, and would love to, to hear from you. Where did it all start? How did you decide that you wanted to work on issues of, of children and women, which then became a lifelong? Passion. Thank you, Isabel. Well, I think the issues around social justice have been with me since I was very, very young, uh, from the age of seven or eight, organizing uh, sales and sign up sheets for all kinds of things. And I think in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, anti discrimination, anti racism, anti apartheid uh, work. That's, that's how old I am towards the end of apartheid, being very active and in working with a lot of wonderful groups in, in, in Southern Africa. And of course, in my own country, Sweden, we had uh, during a time that the country was becoming more um, diverse. Unfortunately, we also saw nationalistic and anti immigrant tendencies. So there was a lot of activism also. Uh, at home. But I think slowly uh, it became uh, more of a focus on, on human rights. Uh, and, and I think it was a bit of a coincidence in a way, because my first UN job was with UNICEF. Um, and at that time, just almost 20 years ago, it wasn't really a hot topic to be working on gender equality. In fact, we had three people in all of UNICEF uh, working on gender equality. And uh, you were really seen as a gender police. You know, it was just another thing that people had to do, but it wasn't seen to be the real work. So when I started working in the field uh, in, in one of the first countries that I worked in very much in depth in, in, in Indonesia, and some of you will recognize the Indonesian statues behind me, um, you know, I, I really hoped and saw that working on children's rights and in particular violence and exploitation against children, that it would be a natural place to really unpack what are the gender dynamics? What are the gender norms? The very deeply gendered vulnerabilities, not just of girls, of boys and girls, because it's so clear in the work. And everywhere I turned, you, you, you saw it from girls being trafficked for sexual, sexual exploitation, uh, the rates of early marriage, particularly for girls, but also the types of child labor that boys were more likely to, to fall into, whether it was in the mines or uh, for criminal gangs or, or the treatment of, of young men and boys in prisons, for example, or, or even boys being subject to corporal punishments by their, by their parents much more than girls or teachers. And then how that created gendered um, socializations that affected them in their lives. And so while the issues were all there, there wasn't a lot of appetite, I want to say, for really approaching things in a, in a gendered way, because the pressure was very much just talk about the child and children and to even unpack 
that we are gendered human beings and we grow up with these expectations of the masculine and the feminine and how that influences us. So for me, when I found you and women, I want to say, or you and women found me, it, it really was uh, as you and women was just created. Uh, they were created in 2010 and became operationalized in January 2011. And that's exactly the month that I joined. Uh, it really felt like coming home because I wasn't yeah. the gender police knocking on the door and saying, oh, this is important. And you didn't have yeah. to convince people so <laughs> so uh, Anna Karin, I, I wanted to, to to stop there because um, um we have spoken many times in these dialogues that a lot of the uh, participants of the dialogues uh, still work in organizations that are much more similar to the ones that you described initially uh, so I can just imagine how dismissive um, the development community must have been to bring in girls and bring in children into the development sort of conversation, especially if done by women. Um, I remember in, um, in the World Bank when Jim Wolferson talked about girls' education, people were, were like, this is mission creep. You know, why are you getting the bank into this? So could you talk a little bit more about how you handled that? So you were disrupting something which was refusing to look at this as a development issue. H how did you handle it? You know, I find that sometimes evidence is the, be is the best uh, is the best strategy. So if you, you know, when you work for the or for organizations that have the benefit of working in the field and, you know, research, you know, when you do research and when you have the data, it's much harder for people to ignore you. So if you can point to where the data is, I think that's, that, that, that is one. But of course, you also have to find allies within the organization who agree with your agenda. And unfortunately, at that time, this was my experience in one particular country, and I'm not saying that this represents the organization now or somebody else might have a very different experience. But the leadership at that time was not particularly uh, open to gender issues. And, and in fact, even many of the female managers who are where I am now, if you will, in the middle of their careers, were struggling very much themselves just to get noticed, uh, just to get recognized, just to get their voices heard. Uh, and so it was very much an, an old boys network, if, if you will. And there, uh, and maybe it sounds uh, petty, but I think sometimes finding male allies yeah. uh, who can carry the agenda for you uh, will get you a different audience that will get you a different result. And so I was very fortunate, for example, that our head of education was really a gender equality champion. And then we could work through, you know, the education as an entry point. So I think finding allies, no matter where they are, and then using them as entry points, so you have different people who carry the message. I think that's that's one. And then I think the evidence and the data is, is, is another. So you were building credibility, both by data and by having allies who themselves had credibility in the organization. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the critical. And I think the last point maybe on that is that it's really about having a benefits based approach. So people respond very poorly to you must do this finger pointing, being told they're not doing something correctly. And I think in the early days, a lot of the assessments we were doing and a lot of the focal points we had, they, they maybe were not particularly helpful in the sense because it was pointing out what was missing. Whereas when you have strong evidence and you can build allies and you can show how it can get better results uh, and how you can reach your goals and that people even sometimes can look good, you know, sometimes it's self-serving. Uh, but yes. if you find those arguments that resonate, you're much more likely to, to succeed in getting those allies, I find. Wonderful. Thank you. Do send comments and questions in the chat if you, if you have. Um, so now let's go to you and women. You and women found you. You joined in the first, uh, you said 2011, right? Ten years yes. ago. Uh, and what was your experience compared to coming from UNICEF, um, uh, which is still a UN agency, but much more, of course, where you have to fight to get the gender issues in. Um, so how, how was that when you arrived? Well, you know, it was like, like, like night and day. And I think the first is, of course, that all of a sudden, your whole organization's raison d'etre and its mission is your passion. And so you don't have to start by getting people on board. People are already on board. Right? Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. share your, your, uh, uh, your, your values, if, if, if you will. 
And I think one thing that's important to understand about you and women is that you and women really sprung from the women's movements. The, the yeah. very fact that you have you and women is because women's activists and women's organizations were advocating uh, mm-hmm. for such an agency. And the fact that you've had an agency for children for so many decades, and yes. it's only in 2010 you have an organization for women. So it tells you something mm-hmm. about just how radical the agenda really is still, and and, and how um, transformative uh, and how transformational that, that, that work is. So for me, that really felt like coming home in a sense. And I think one of the, and then going to work on violence against women and running campaigns and programs of ending violence against women, I think it, it felt like being able to really work on the root causes of what I was seeing earlier in my career, trying to understand why does violence happen? How can we understand it? Because only if you understand it, can you prevent it? And so it really went into a very, for me, a very deep journey of, yes, we have a human right to be protected from violence. We have a right to service, we have a right to justice, but ultimately that right means very little unless we can also tackle prevention. So uh, really being able to immerse myself in the work on social norms change, uh, and working on, on the prevention side and trying to understand how you can stop violence before it starts, uh, that has been a really interesting journey. And so then maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know, in the beginning, it felt like a very narrow interest that I felt I shared with very few people trying to have evidence-based prevention programming and, and, and working on prevention of violence. And then all of a sudden in the midst of this, we have Me Too. And it, it was like, you know, turning on the tap, all of a sudden my issue was everybody's issue. The, the issue that I had struggled to knock on the door, it was like it was front page news. Uh, so that was a huge uh, a kind of shock to me where you're used <laughs> to being in a very small space and all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of people talking about consent and power relations and, and all of that. So yeah, it's been very interesting to see the shift over, over, over the last, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Now, UN Women is born out of the of different organizations, but it is within the UN system, which was created in 1945, and has very um, masculine sort of um, structures. Um, you know, procurement, financial management, HR. Um, so how how so you had a lot of women that come from the women's movement and other places, and then you are fit within this patriarchal structure how how did that feel yeah this is i mean this is a great question uh isabel and i think this is really part of of the complex identity of 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 of, of being you and women as an entity that is uh driving a transformative feminist agenda in a in a patriarchal structure if you will and i think we have a culture more than many other agencies certainly within the un system that is still very feminist in a sense of people speak out and uh, there's a lot of debate and there's quite a large tolerance for um, you know, discussions and consultations and uh, disagreement even. And, and so from that perspective, it's mentally quite, uh, quite stimulating. But of course, at the end of the day, we are measured by very m- metric driven results, right? And I think there I have come sort of to maybe from a more feminist place to a more masculine place, if you will, myself, as I've moved up, you know, in my leadership uh, ladder, if you will, because you come from, there's, there can be tension between those who are feminists, experts, uh, specialists, uh, who want to focus on the substance and on the rights argument, the human rights argument, which are of course very valid and relevant versus those who, if you want to be critical, could say it's more bureaucratic, it's more administrative, and it's more about results, efficiency, value for money, <laughs> indicators, uh, budgets, etc. But actually, I've become a fan of, of those sides over the years, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I've realized that if you don't get results, you don't get money. And if you don't get money, you can't scale your programming. Yes. Not just money, but support from donors, credibility. So the results you have to be able to measure. Uh, And so I actually find now that, yes, it is a contradiction, but we need both. We can't afford to lose one because if you debate and you discuss amongst yourself, what value do you actually bring to your constituencies, the women and girls in the world that you're serving? It doesn't lead necessarily to anything. So you have to channel the energy, you have to challenge the knowledge and the depth of that substantive knowledge is part of your credibility as well. 
right? It's not just management. It's, it's, it's substance, but then driving that substance intentionally towards concrete results that you can measure. And with that, then you can build support and, and sort of scale your impact, right? So, so what, you, what you learned in UNICEF, you basically brought it to UN Women to be effective, which is the credibility, the measurement, and being able to actually grow like you have. Without that, you wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what um, um, I'm, I have a question in the chat that I'll come later. Um, so what, what about the human resource side of this? Uh, being a leader amongst leaders, um, what are the, the strengths um, that you look for in people who are working within this context and what are the sort of weaknesses that you find you, people usually bring that need to be developed? Mm. Well, there, I mean, there are, there are so many uh, aspects of this question. I think it's a really complex one, but I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest insights for me at least is not seeking to hire, promote, work with, support people who are like yourself. Yeah. And I think that's the tendency. And in fact, when you look back at why women have been disadvantaged, just like people of color or people with disabilities or, or any other group has not yeah. been given that voice has been because we've had, let's be honest, white men in power who felt comfortable with other men, white men who went to similar schools as they did, et cetera. And so we can take that in different ways. It could be from, from, from uh, ethnicity or you know, uh, geographic background, it can be gender, it can be age, uh, yeah. but also personality. We tend to be quite, uh, and I think people will see, I'm, I'm extroverted, I'm talkative, I'm quite open. And, and we see that, that the system favors people like that in a way. And so for me then to really think of a, a team and to appreciate and to acknowledge and to recognize and to take the time to really learn to appreciate those who do not share that, who are not like you, who are not from your part of the world, who don't necessarily have the same personality traits and to appreciate that diversity. Um, and particularly for, and here we find women disproportionately, women who are quieter, who are not beating their own drum, who are minimizing sometimes their own contributions to give others space. But when you dig deeper, the, the quality of, of their work is, is so, significant and yet it often goes unrecognized whereas men in this regard they they do tend to have uh, more often than not a drive for personal success for individual recognition um and it it works and so i think for, for leaders to be mindful of that and to see through that and to make sure that we are then creating spaces for for people to shine who may not be the ones to put the spotlight on themselves. I think that's that's really important. That's and also creating diversity, you know. So diversity is very difficult to manage. You when you have unicultural organizations, they tend to be around the mean in terms of performance. Diverse organizations tend to be worse or much better. But the difference is how do you manage that diversity with a lot of feminine qualities about nurturing, about listening about making sure every voice is heard but also bringing in the voices of people that don't think like you i think that that's that's wonderful so let me open anybody has has questions this is a, a very rich conversation and i would like you to be part of it so we have somebody already asking how can young women become involved in the un women so that's the first one any other questions Very well. Bas, how do you create the space for women who do not beat their own drum to be heard? Great question. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe start with this last one first because it was on yes. what we were just talking about. When I reflect on my own journey and where, how I was able to be successful in where I wanted to go at least <laughs> was because I had the support of leaders who were above me at that time. And I've had both. I've had women leaders, older women who were very comfortable, who could see a young woman and say, you know, she, she has a lot of drive, she has a lot of energy, she wants to, to do something, I'm going to support that and nurture that. But I also had, in some of these masculine environments, women who themselves, as I mentioned, were 
didn't have that confidence because they didn't have the support around them. And they themselves were fighting for survival. And so they were exercising in my mind, the opposite of feminist leadership, which was then maybe not giving <clears throat> younger women under them the visibility or the recognition even for their own work. Um, and I can see that now. And so I think that really made me think of who I, who I want to be as a leader, particularly for, for women. And I think it's about facilitating spaces in discussions. It means pushing people sometimes out of their comfort zones. If you know that someone has knowledge about a particular issue, but they don't have the confidence to speak, you can find maybe internal meetings or discussions where they are more comfortable to build that space, to lead a discussion, to lead a discussion with male peers that it's not, you know, the leader speaking, but maybe it's, you give more uh, junior colleagues the, the, the chance to position themselves as leaders in spaces where, where they can. Uh, so I think that is one. I've become a big fan, and Isabel, I've learned a lot from you and the team about, you know, participatory methodologies and how do you um, find safe spaces for those voices to enlarge, recognizing that it's not always putting someone in the spotlight, but it's finding more peer-based learning or sharing approaches. So I think that tends to uh, work. Um, but I think it's really just gently moving people towards the edge of their comfort zone while supporting them <laughs> and not pushing them over the edge either and then expanding. And then the more, it's like a muscle, right? Leadership, it's like a muscle. It's the more you exercise it, the more natural it becomes. And when people get success, and then they get recognized for that and they are seen, then they, they grow from that and they want to do more. So I think it's sometimes just knowing that you have someone's back and letting them be there. But then of course, in the end, the accountability is with you as the leader. So if somebody yeah. fails or makes a mistake, they need to know that you're not gonna that's throw them under the bus, you know, that you, yeah. will, you will take it. You know, that's that the buck stops with you in the end because that's, that's yeah. what it is. So that's right. maybe some, some reflection of that. On the support for young women, I mean, I think activism is always so important. And no matter where you come from, there are, you know, civil society organizations, women's organizations who do a lot of work on the ground. I know it's not, you know, the same uh, maybe recognition as the UN, but in the end, that is where a lot of the work is being done. Uh, civil society, women's rights organizations. And that's a great place to start because you get actual skills on how do you do advocacy? How do you support building services for women? How do you advocate for policies? So there are women's rights organizations who have been behind new legislation on domestic violence, right? Or hold governments accountable for uh, strengthening services to domestic abuse survivors or so I would just encourage anyone who's interested particularly in, in, in UN women or in the UN in general to actually start by being involved in organizations that are accessible to you and then that's of course you build work um, um, experience that, that then can be used. Now finally this was not the case before but I'm very happy that at least within the UN now we also pay it's not a lot but at least interns are paid a stipend and that's essential because before otherwise you would only have people from a certain category of, of family, frankly, who could afford to take on an unpaid internship. Yeah, in New York or wherever. Yeah, yeah. in New York or, in, or no matter where it is. And, and so there are, uh, you know, paid internships. So that's, you know, another po uh, possibility um, to sort of get your, your foot in the door and then to build those relationships and build those skills. Um, even if the, the, the stage of an actual you know, job might be a few years down the line, you know, you can build it through the activism with other organizations, through internships, through, you know, shorter term engagement. So that would be my, you know. Yeah. I think my compliment to that is that the, the agenda is so large and has advanced so little in terms of changing the system when Beijing 25 years ago uh, talked about equality and there's not one country that has equality for women. And so, uh, the, the, the women's movement has been so important in the creation of UN women, but it continues to be important. I think in getting involved you know, at, at, at the sort of best level that you can um, is, is, is absolutely essential for us to get there someday. Antoinette, you had, um, you had a question that you had seen sent beforehand. 
did you or or if you have another question that's also okay yes no i'm just wondering is it the, the one about feminism feminist that okay yeah. so i think the question that was coming in was um how do you define these different you know we've been working a lot with the ideas around feminine leadership and and also just thank you so much for what you've been bringing in and these different you know varying views around uh gender as well and you know what it means to 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 grow up in a society that genders us you know in um as human beings so thank you for that um, initial discussion. And I think the question is, you know, as we look at these terms, how do we differentiate between, if there is a difference between feminine leadership, feminist leadership and women's leadership and having, you know, women at the forefront and, and you know, how, from your perspective and or UN women's perspective, um, do, you, do you all hold that? This is a, such a great question, right? And I think it's about an earlier session you've been talking about how women's leadership is not at all always feminist leadership, right? And in fact, in many times it's, it's the contrary because to succeed in the proverbial man's world, you know, women sometimes have embodied leadership principles that are, that are, that are really the opposite uh, of, 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 of feminist leadership. Uh, now, of course, when we think of even what is feminine and what is masculine, this is not constant. And even what we consider as feminine or masculine are constantly challenged, negotiated, and changing. Uh, and so I think, Isabel, you might be better equipped to, to sort of say what your notion is of the feminine leadership. But if we think of what is seen as feminine, being a good listener, being collaborative, having good emotional intelligence, uh, really inspiring others, uh, nurturing and supporting, and we think of these as feminine traits. But actually, when we look at any modern leadership leadership book, those are the traits that men are now taught to embody to be effective leaders, right? When we think of the traditional masculine traits, the drive for results, the drive for accountability, the metrics, the, you know, the strategy, the analysis, you know, we also know that, yes, that can guide strategy. Yeah, we need it. And we talked about that before when I was uh, now uh, coordinating the development of our plan. We need to have a mission statement. We need to have goals. We need to have objectives. We need to, we need to structure our work in a very logical way. That is what guides us. That is the masculine already. But to drive that, so if you have the, we have the guiding path <laughs> of the strategy and, and, the, and the metrics, but to drive the change, we still come back to culture. We come back to our values. We come back to our practices. We come back to our behaviors. And so in the strategy that we have been developing, we've also really been actively trying to make sure that we walk the talk. And so that gives me, brings me to this, this feminist leadership. And we actually call it internally, we've been uh, toying with this idea of feminist excellence, actually, because we have on one hand, feminist leadership, leadership that is inclusive, that is ethical, that is shared, that uh, inspires others, that in, nurtures others. But we also need the organizational excellence principles. We are public servants. We are custodians of global taxpayers' money. We have an accountability to deliver the best value for money that we can, because otherwise we are not good public servants. <laughs> and so this is why uh, we also then have the other side of that, which is efficiency, which is um, accountability which is strong management principles. And so we, in, in, in our plan, we really try to balance both the, the, the feminist agenda and, and the um, transformative results that we are driving, but also to have the internal, how we organize ourselves as an organization, how we drive our own organization, and to do that in a way that is both um, in line with our feminist values to make sure that we hold our leaders accountable for increasing diversity, for empowering others, for involving young people, for being inclusive, um, while we also hold them accountable for delivering results and value for money. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's what I would say. And definitely we have, we're very lucky to have many men in, in our organization who I, I would say embody feminist leadership. 
And like every organization, we have men and women who, who do not fully embody those. And this is why we have to build. And that's, and that's I think, our commitment for all organizations to, uh, to, to support. So that's maybe just a, some reflections on my side. But Isabel, maybe you want to come in and compliment, because I think the feminine leadership is something that you have been driving as well as, as part of these series. Yeah. So a very interesting um, experience. Um, so I was working on feminine leadership uh, not that long ago with um, the women of SEWA. Uh, who's an organization of informal sector workers, all women, um, around 1.7 million. And I spoke about the feminine leadership and they really didn't like it. And they said, for us, feminine is things that you don't want to be. We want to be feminist. Uh, and so then we started the conversation and actually it, it was about not appreciating and not valuing what they bring as women because they felt they're in a men's world and they have to fight for equal rights but a very masculine warrior energy and so appreciating how those intrinsic values that they have are also important was part of the differentiating between you can be a feminist and you can be feminine in the way you fight including as, as uh, Anna Karin was saying bringing in your, your masculine for results, but not leaving the feminine out. I think that that was for me a eye-opening how they thought about feminine, yeah. Any other questions? So I wanted to ask you, because we didn't have time to cover it, uh, Anna Karin, a little bit about the strategy process that you just did, and in what way you think that that was um, tapping or drawing in from this feminine, feminine leadership um, sort of qualities. Well, I think it, it, it really has been a, um, I, I would hope to say that it's been a feminist <laughs> process as well as a feminine one. But I think the fact that, you know, spanning one year, uh, we engaged and, you know, we have my, my team members on this call who, who as, uh, have as much credit for, for, for that journey as, as I do. It's definitely been a collective effort, uh, but to really be conscious about how we wanted to consult and to bring in voices, diverse voices. And that meant going to the regions, talking to civil society, talking to our own staff, our own colleagues at all levels, talking to our sister UN agencies, not only to governments, to really hear from them, where do you think we are at our best? What should we drop? Where should we be? How can we make the biggest difference? And of course we could have, you know, hired some fancy consultant and, and sat and, and written a strategy for, you know, in, in much shorter time, but it wouldn't have had the same buy-in. And so I think we try to, you know, use this process as a way to also build buy-in and build ownership. And I think it, it, as, as a change process, actually. Um, and so I hope now that having come at the end of that and having had the strategy approved, we're much better equipped to begin the very important, I would say more important conversation of how can we collectively as leaders drive the implementation of this. And so I think from that perspective, it, it has been more of a inclusive, participatory, listening, deep listening exercise that would be associated, I think, with, 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 with feminine leadership. Um, oh, but I think in the- And, and it was really well, re, well received in this masculine world, right? Right, right. And I think it's interesting because everybody wants to be heard, right? And I think speaking is one thing, but when you reflect back, to have even whether you were Brazil or the Russian Federation or Algeria or Germany, they said, we feel like you heard us. They may not have agreed with every word. They may not have liked everything because of course the feedback was very different, but they all said, what we have at the end is balanced. And we mm -hmm. felt that you listened and you took it on board. You know, And that, that to me is, is, is very important as a process. But I think there is something in the content which is also quite important from a, you know, feminist leadership perspective or, or, you know, movement building perspective, which is it's much stronger this time around on thinking, not just what we can do, but what we can get others to do. And I think from that perspective, it's, it's what we go through as leaders, actually. In the beginning, it's very much what we can achieve. How good is your report? 
how well do you deliver your project? We think about what we have to do. But as we move up, you know, and, and move along our, our path, what you can do is much less important because there's only so many hours in the day. So your value and your influence is really what you can get others to do. How can yeah. you support others? And so the, the strategy for us now is also one like that. It has a stronger focus on influencing others, working through partnerships, supporting movement building, including of women's organizations, and really looking at how others can change their own actions, behaviors, and even financing decisions to support the agenda. And so uh, trying to be more of a, of a, of a catalyst uh, to move others along, because that is really the only way that we that we can get to that that we can get to scale. And I think as leaders, we need to similarly think in those in 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 those terms uh, if we want to have the, as much impact as impact. As possible. Absolutely, mm. yes. Very good.